And again, what I would like to do for today is do a few more examples from section 5.2, and then we'll move on to section 5.3. So let's go ahead and get started here. If you recall from section 5.2, we were working on an example where I had given you a graph and I had mentioned that you might imagine it as like a pizza box where these are eight by eight units. And then we cut out the corners. So we'll cut out all four corners. And those will all be the same X by X. So then the idea is once I have removed the corners, I will fold this box up on itself and we are trying to calculate the volume. So we came up with the volume function and it depended on X. And we came up with length which was eight minus two X. Width was also eight minus two X. And then the height was X itself. So recall the eight minus two X came from subtracting off these individual corners. And we did this both for length and for width. And then the height came from if you folded it up that distance there is your height. So we did a bunch of work and we found um, several things. So first of all, I did not do this on Wednesday, but I do think it's worthwhile to maybe write down its expanded form. So if you were to distribute everything across, you would end up with four X cubed minus 32 X squared plus 64 X. The reason that I did that is because now it tells me my degree and my leading coefficient. So we were trying to graph this function. We now know that it's a cubic and it's going to do something like this. So we're in that kind of special case. Again, degree being odd with a positive leading coefficient. So we could maybe even make those comments here. Degree is three, which is odd. And the leading coefficient is four. Most importantly, it is positive. So that's like step one when you are starting to graph the function. So then step two is finding the intercepts. So we first found V of zero. And if you have it in this form, it's kind of easy to see that if I plugged zero in here, here, and here, I would end up with zero. So I know that this thing goes through the origin. So I can add that to my graph. Then if we were to find the other intercepts for step three, you set the function equal to zero. So if I do that, I'm going to take it back to this form. So I have zero equals eight minus two X. That's going to happen twice. So multiplicity two. And then I also have, again, the origin. So from the multiplicity portion, what that tells me is that X will equal four. So now I know that I have the intercepts zero, zero, which we already knew from step two. And then the other intercept where X is equal to four and Y is equal to zero. So now I know it's going to do something like this. 
And then if you recall, for step four, what we did was a sign chart. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to list my three factors along the column and then list my zeros across the row. And we'll look at the different intervals. So for step four in my sign chart, I think this is where we left off on Wednesday. We have one factor, which is four X, or we could even take it back further. Let's do eight minus two X. And we had two of those. So we could do eight minus two X and then another eight minus two X and then the factor X and then our original function F of X. And then maybe somebody in the chat or using your microphone, what were the zeros that I will list across the top? So close, let me go ahead and give you a hint. We calculated the zeros in step three. So we had two of them. One of them was zero itself. Then what was the other? Yeah, good, zero and four, excellent. Nathan. So we'll do them in order. We'll do zero first and then we'll do four. So these were our two zeros. They go on top of your sign chart. And then recall how we do this is we leave space, put in your zero, drop a vertical bar, put in your other zero, drop a vertical bar, and then leave some space for the end of the chart. And then maybe somebody pick a number that is less than zero any number that is less than zero. Sure, negative seven, okay. So if I plug in negative seven, what I will end up with here is a positive. Again, I don't care about the value, I only care about the sign. So if it's true there, it's also true here. But then if I plug it in here, I would get a negative. We multiply all three to give me a negative. Then maybe somebody else, pick a number between zero and four. Two. Sure. Okay. So if I plug a two in for X, that would give me a positive. Then I would repeat that here. And then here, a positive two would give me a positive. So all three of those multiplied together give me a positive. And then maybe I'll pick one greater than four, like say 10. So that would be negative, negative, positive, which would remain positive. And remember the idea here is that we are looking where we are either below or above the X axis. So then for step five, we can put all of this information together and do our plot. So we knew from our end behavior degree and leading coefficient that it's going to do something like this and like this. From step two, we calculated our y-intercept. Step three, our x-intercept. And now using our sign chart, we are below the x-axis until we hit zero. So it'll look something like this. Then from zero to four, we are above our x-intercept, or x-axis rather. 
And then from four beyond, we stay above. So I'm going to make a note here. There's a reason why this happens. And we briefly discussed this on Wednesday. So recall, we had a multiplicity of two when x equaled four. So if x equaled four multiplicity two, here was our four. Notice it did what we call a rebound. So it went above and then stayed above. So if your multiplicity is even, you rebound. Meaning it'll stay either above or below. It'll still come down and touch this value, but it will just bounce back on itself. So there's a question that says, when it's even, can it be an even number? So that's just coincidence. This number could have been nine. It could have been 13. The thing that really matters is this. So did that answer your question, Nathan? It's not necessarily the value itself, but rather it's multiplicity. So then we also had x equals zero, but it only had one multiplicity. That only happened one time. So in this case, the multiplicity is odd one being an odd number, therefore it passed through. So maybe I'll just say like this. So that's kind of how you know the difference between the two. If you have an even multiplicity like we did here, we had two of those solutions, then you'll know it'll do this rebound. But if you have an odd multiplicity like we did for the other zero, then it went straight through it. So I think it'd be a good idea to maybe practice one more before we move on to the next section. Are there any questions with this example? So let's try another one. So let's say that you're given the following function and we are gonna graph by hand using our steps. And the first thing I'll do is just write it in its factored form, 2x plus 1 times x plus 1 times x minus 1. So according to our steps, the first thing that I want to do is find its degree and leading coefficient. I think the easiest way to do that is maybe to multiply it all out. Um, I can tell its degree. I have one, two, three x's. But the leading coefficient's a little harder. So let's just do some algebra and practice. So 2x plus 1. And then I notice this is a difference of squares. So that would turn into x squared minus 1. Then I could FOIL, that's probably how you learned it in high school. So we could do 2x cubed minus 2x plus x squared 
minus one. So I did my two X cubed from here, then the minus two X from here, X squared from here, and then finally minus one. So I'm just gonna rewrite this in descending order. So two X cubed plus X squared minus two X minus one. So then for step one, we can now see our degree. So can somebody either using your mic or the chat, tell me what the degree is? Yeah, it is three. Yeah, it is the largest power in the polynomial. And so most importantly, we know it's odd. And then the leading coefficient is two from here. And most importantly, it's positive. So like our example before, we know we will have something that goes up in the first quadrant and down in the second quadrant, or in the third quadrant. And I didn't write this in arrow notation from the beginning, um, but let's just go ahead and do that. So as X goes to positive infinity, F of X goes to positive infinity. And then as X goes to negative infinity, F of X also goes to negative infinity. So then let me take a look at, there's a couple of questions in the chat here. So did you just distribute in the beginning? Yeah, so what I did is I first distributed here and maybe I can do this as side work. So I did X times X, which gave me X squared. And then I did X times minus one, which gave me minus X. And then positive one times X gave me positive X. And then positive one times negative one gave me the negative one. So then what happened was these middle terms canceled, which gave me just X squared minus one. Then what I did is I distributed here. So two X times X squared gave me my two X cubed. Two X times minus one gave me my minus two X. One times X squared gave me my plus X squared. And then finally one times negative one gave me my minus one. So did that clarify things for you? Okay. Then I just went ahead and reordered things so that it was in descending order. And then from there, just walking through the different steps for sketching. So I know, again, it's going to do something like this. I don't know yet what's happening in the middle, but I do know that the end behavior will look like this. So then for step two, I will plug zero into the function. So maybe I'll plug it in at this stage. That's probably the easiest place. So if I plug zero in here, here, and here, it'll wipe out those three terms. And all I'm left with is negative one. So I know I have an intercept at zero comma negative one. So if X is equal to zero, Y is equal to negative one. Then for step three, I will find the X intercepts. So give me just a moment here to get a clean board. <clears throat> So once I'm at step three, finding the x-intercepts, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it from its original factored form. That's the easiest way to do this. So 
I will have zero equals two x plus one times x plus one, x minus one. So again, just taking it from here. And the reason that I'm doing that is because now I can break these apart and set them all equal to zero. So zero equals two x plus one, zero equals x plus one, and zero equals x minus one. So I have minus one half equals x and then minus one equals x and plus one equals x. Typically, I will have you write them as ordered pairs. So you have the point minus one half comma zero, minus one comma zero, and one comma zero. So here are some things we know now. Let's go ahead and just kind of recap our first three steps. So if I were to graph this, we now know that it'll look something like this. Let's call this minus one and positive one and minus one. So we're going to go through the point negative, zero, negative one half comma zero, negative one comma zero and positive one comma zero. We also had a y-intercept of zero comma negative one. We know our end behavior does the following. So somehow all of this has to happen. Now here's where we will need our sign chart. So let me again grab another board so we can draw a nice sign chart for this. <clears throat> so we have our three factors that are listed here, 2x plus 1, x plus 1, and x minus 1. So this is step 4. We have 2x plus 1 x plus one, x minus one, and then our full function. And then our zeros for negative one. So again, leave space and then put in your negative one and drop a vertical then negative one half and a vertical and then positive one. And then just like before, we'll pick values in between each interval. So I'll go ahead and do this one for sake of time. Let's say I picked a negative two, for example. Then I have a negative, a negative, and a negative, which will make this negative. So I know that I am below the x-axis. This one's a little more challenging. Let's say we do something like negative 3 fourths. So if you do negative 3 fourths, you'd come up with negative, positive, negative, which would create a positive value for your function. So I would be above. Then maybe I'd pick positive 3 fourths. So I'd have a positive, a positive, and a negative to create a negative value. So again, below. And then anything bigger than 1. So all of these would be positive and I'd be back above. So now we can actually do our sketch. We were at negative one, 
positive one, negative one, one half, and it went something like this and something like this. So now I can see that I will be below the x-axis until I hit negative one. Then I go above between one, negative one and negative one half. So that takes care of these two. Then I go back below, which makes sense because I have to hit this y-intercept. I stay below until I hit the next x-intercept. So that takes care of that one. And then finally, I go back above. Are there any questions with this sketch or any of the algebra? Okay, so if not, I think I'd like to go ahead and start on the next section, which is section 5.3. So in this section, we are going to do division of polynomials and talk about a couple of theorems. So we probably won't get through it all today, but I would at least like to introduce the topics. Okay, so. And just shorthand that. Okay, so I think the best way to start the section is just to look at a couple of examples and then we'll look at some notation. So in this example, what we're going to do is we're going to um, just do some basic arithmetic. So let's think about taking the division of, I'm just gonna make up some numbers here, like 145 divided by say three. So it's probably been a while since you've done longhand division. Most people use calculators these days, but it is important that we understand the different definitions. So first of all, of course, you take three, won't go into one. So then you go into 14. So if I do that, I get four and then 12 and subtract. So then you get two. And then maybe using the mic or uh, the chat, what would I do next? So after I did this subtraction, what should I do next? Yeah, good, just drop down the five. So sometimes I'll do it like this. And then three goes into 25, uh, eight times to give me 24. So multiplying eight by three and subtract, and it looks like I get a remainder of one. So let's just go through the definitions here. So, if you think about everything that we've just done. It, so it's not straight up division. We're going to do it with polynomials. 
So I'm just showing you basic arithmetic to remind you of some of the definitions. And then we'll do this with polynomials in just a moment. So in the, in the homework that I'll be posting, it'll ask you to identify, say, the quotient. So the quotient is your answer, which in this case is 48. Then it will, might ask you for the dividend. Dividend. So that's the thing on the inside. Then the divisor, which is the thing on the outside. And finally, the remainder. So I wanted to just give you a quick example of something that you're fam familiar with. That way you can kind of familiarize yourself with these different definitions. So what we're going to do now is we're going to step it up a notch and do it with polynomials. Uh, maybe I'll do this on a different board. So when you're doing these divisions, it does take a lot of space. So let's try on a clean whiteboard the following. Let's find all of those things for the following. Let's say we have um, this example, find quotient and remainder when the dividend is x squared plus x minus six and divisor is x minus two. So we'll just start with a nice example as an introduction. So to do this longhand, dividend again goes on the inside, x squared plus x minus six, and then divisor goes on the outside. Now I wanna make a note here. It's very important that these are written in descending order. So highest power to smallest power, and you need to do it for both. So if they are not expressed that way, you need to rewrite them so that they are. Now, here's the trick, and maybe I'll do this in a different color. It's a little bit more complicated because these are polynomials. So what we're going to do is we're only going to focus on the first part of the divisor. So as I go through this process, I'm going to ask myself, what do I multiply this first term by in order to make it look like x squared. So I would need to multiply x by x. That way, when I distribute, I'd get x squared. But then recall, you also have to distribute it through the entire binomial. So then I would have a minus 2x. Then carefully subtract. So the whole point is these first terms should cancel. If they do not, you made a mistake. And now I have x minus negative 2x to give me 3x. Now I will repeat the process. What do I multiply x by to get 3x? A positive 3. Therefore, when I distribute, I get 3 times x, which is 3x, and then minus 6. But again, just like in arithmetic, I will drop this minus 6 down. That way, when I subtract, these cancel, as do these. 
So if you were being asked to find the quotient, I'll just call it Q, you would present the answer on top, X plus three, and then the remainder is zero from here. So are there any questions with this problem? So you don't, the negative two only comes into play when you do the distribution. So for instance, in this first step, when I did the X times X, that's where the X squared comes from. And then the negative two only comes into play when you do the distribution. So negative two times X gave me the negative two X here. And then the negative two times three gave me the negative six down here. Any other questions? Okay, I think I'll stop there. I do have several more examples, but we're just about out of time. So I want to, again, just thank you for your patience. I will be posting more homework and I will continue to Zoom on Monday, but as always, just keep checking your notifications and, and your email, and I'll post this recording as soon as I can get it converted. So if there's nothing else, have a good rest of your morning and happy Earth Day. Thank you, Professor. Thank happy you. Earth Day. Have a good morning.